Now we have all met Mr. Do, are you a doctor? Did you get your PhD? I, no, no, I have two masters, but not a PhD. <laughs> okay, you're working on it. <laughs> uh, no, no, uh, I. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. <laughs> right, 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 right. Okay, well, Richard was kind enough to come, and uh, I here have articles with his picture in it. Most of the time he's smiling, because he is a smiling guy. He is a very up person, but one of the pictures he looked very sad. But when I told him about it, he said he was asked to look like that because he had been into some tragic situation. Because when they had the explosion in Lawrence, Richard lives in Andover, but his house in Andover caught fire. And the week, a couple of weeks before that, his wife works as a teller at the bank in Shawshin Village. She was robbed. There was a, a fellow that came and demanded money from her. So she looks very sad in the picture. So, and his father is a very up person. His father is very positive. And Richard is like his father, so this wasn't like him to be down like that. Because the father was coming out of the hospital the day that Richard had the fire. So now Richard had to move in with the father. And the father is saying, isn't that a wonderful thing that I'm going home and my son and daughter-in-law are going to be there with me? Isn't, oh, God is good. Yeah. So anyway, you want to look at these articles about Richard. And, um, and Richard is ready to talk about the, pre the vice president's wives, how the woman behind the man. Oh. So yes. it's all yours, Richard. All right. Thank you, Gloria. Okay. So uh, uh, thank you to Gloria for inviting me here to speak this evening. I think uh, we had worked out the, uh, this uh, date like last summer, you know, and it seemed like uh, it would be a long time before May 9th uh, arrived, you know, compared to last summer when Gloria and I worked out this date. So. Uh, so here we are now. It's uh, almost a year later after we worked this out, and uh, so I'm happy to be here tonight uh, and to talk about my uh, my second book, uh, which uh, came out in September of '17. It's called um, "Who Are They?" Uh, a look at vice presidential spouses from uh, Abigail Adams to Karen Pence. So uh, a couple of years ago, uh, what I thought I'd do is I, uh, well, I, I teach history at Northern Essex Community College in Havel, and I love to write. So um, I had written one book in 2007 uh, about my experiences on the campaign trail, uh, helping out presidential candidates. And uh, then uh, 10 years later, 2017, uh, it took me 10 years, but I was in the mood again, uh, 10 years after the first book, to, to do some more writing. So I thought, uh, what, uh, what group of people out there uh, doesn't get enough attention? I, I'd like to bring them to light, you know? So I'm thinking, well, there's plenty of books out there about presidents. There's uh, enough books out there about first ladies. Uh, there's some books out there about uh, vice presidents. But I could not find uh, a book about second ladies or the wives of the vice presidents. So I thought uh, that was ripe for some research and some writing about so I, uh, it took me a year uh, to do the research and the writing from uh, September of 16 to September of 17, but uh, I did it uh, during my free time, and it was a good education for me since I do teach history, including presidential history. Uh, this was a good education for me, what I learned in, in doing this uh, research to put this uh, book together. So um, it is comprehensive. It, it goes from our first second lady, Abigail Adams, uh, right up through and including the current second lady, Karen Pence. Um, so it's, it's an overview of each second lady. So I, I give basically the facts, uh, where they were born, when they were born, 
uh, their upbringing, their education, if I could find it. For most of them, it's, it's, it's researchable. Um, and then uh, uh, I talk about when they married their husband, uh, when their husband became vice president, and uh, what the second lady did, if anything. Uh, again, with a few of them, I could not find any information about what they did uh, when they were a second lady. Uh, probably, and because these women would have been in the 1800s, probably that meant they didn't really do anything at that time. So therefore, there was no information about them uh, on their time as second lady. So anyway, but for the vast majority, I found out things that they did while their husbands were vice president. So I talked about that, and then, uh, and then I talked about uh, what happened when, when their husband left office, where they retired to, uh, and then when the, uh, when the second lady passed away and where she's buried. So again, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an overview of each uh, second lady, uh, but it's a good basic uh, uh, education about each, each uh, lady. So, um, all right, so uh, this evening now, uh, when I give a talk, uh, and uh, uh, Tom, for example, was here uh, two years ago when I gave a talk on the poet Robert Frost, so you may remember, but uh, whenever I give a talk, uh, what I do is I give out a quiz. It's ungraded, okay? <laughs> so it just stays in this room here, okay? All right. And uh, I'll give you a few minutes. To, it's multiple choice, okay? And then we'll go over the quiz, okay? And then the answers to the quiz become the discussion for this evening, okay? okay. So I find that's what works best, you know, for, for my preferences. Okay. So um, now in the introduction to my book, uh, I talk about question number one there. Uh, with whom did the title second lady take hold? Um, so would um, somebody like to volunteer to give us what they think is the correct answer for number one? I just guess Barbara Bush. Uh, no. No? No. I did Tipper. Yes. Really? Yes, Tipper Gore. Okay. Yes. That was used my second choice. Yes. So. Okay. Right. Okay. So yes, um, Tipper Gore was the one uh, with whom uh, the title Second Lady took hold and gained acceptance. Okay. Uh, basically, what happened was uh, in the 1990s uh, she took on some attention getting uh, policy, public mm -hmm. policy roles. Okay. Uh, for example, she conducted a, uh, an active uh, 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 campaign. Uh, fighting indecent material in the entertainment yep. industry, right, yep. with videos and movies, okay. So this gained uh, the notice now of the, uh, of the media, and uh, by doing so, it lent uh, an air of prominence to this position, okay, of the vice presidential spouse uh, that uh, for so long uh, just like sat on the back burner. Okay, so because Tipper Gore took on this very public, very visible role, uh, trying to clean up the entertainment industry, okay, uh, and therefore now the media took note of this, uh, that brought the position of um, second lady now to the forefront, uh, from the back burner to the front burner, okay. So since the 90s now to the present, uh, the title second lady has taken a uh, hold in, in America, okay, and it, you can you can trace it back to Tipper Gore and her campaign, you know, against uh, indecency in the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. All right, so, okay, um, number two. Uh, despite her best efforts, uh, this future second lady's support and advocacy of women's rights were not advanced by the American Revolution. Uh, with only white males having the full privileges of citizenship. That would be Abigail Adams. Yes, it would be. Very good. Abigail Adams. I did too. Wow. Yes. I said Abigail Adams. Yes. yes. Yeah. I think this one probably, if you thought about it, you can probably guess correctly it was Abigail Adams. Okay. Um, yeah. So with um, with Abigail now. Uh, she was, um, she was very outspoken for a woman uh, of her time. Uh, back then, women were not expected to you know, speak out on things and 
offer their opinion on things, on current events, current affairs. So she was a strong uh, advocate of emancipation of slaves uh, and of women's rights, and uh, particularly the rights of the property rights mm -hmm. of married women. Okay, because back then, uh, if a woman happened to have property, uh, when she got married, she was expected to give it up to her husband. Okay, so Abigail felt that you know women should be able to retain uh, property. Okay, even when when they got uh, married, uh, uh, property rights. So, uh, and she was also a very strong advocate for uh, equality in public education for women, okay, that women should be able to get the same public education that a man got back then. And uh, her views, uh, all these, these things I mentioned now, so they constituted her major views uh, at the time, uh, they were considered too progressive uh, for that era, okay, that, you know, she's just, she's out there, and she, you know, she's a lunatic, and, uh, we, we, you know, these things are totally unacceptable, okay? Now, um, when her husband John was involved in the American Revolution, okay, uh, he was away from home in Braintree, Mass, for quite some time, okay? So, as you may know, Abigail and John had this very prolific correspondence going, written correspondence, okay? They exchanged a ton of letters back and forth, so they, they kept in close touch that way, even though physically they weren't together because of uh, the American Revolution. So uh, <coughs> one of the very poignant letters that Abigail wrote to John while he was away, um, which I talk about in the book, uh, and I'll give you the direct quote, uh, it was dated March 31st, uh, 1776, all right? Uh, and this is from Abigail to John, quote, uh, I desire you would remember the ladies. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Uh, remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. Uh, if particular care and attention uh, is not paid to the ladies, we are determined uh, to foment a rebellion. Mm. All right, so she was threatening uh, her husband, uh, John, with rebellion from the female population, okay, if their concerns and rights were not taken into account uh, when uh, the American Revolution was being fought, okay. So, uh, unfortunately for Abigail, at, at, the, uh, at the second, at the, uh, at the Continental Congress, okay, uh, women's rights were not taken uh, into account or discussed, okay, so it went nowhere. And again, despite her best efforts, <clears throat> uh, uh, when the American Revolution was all said and done, it was still, it was just white males only who had the full privileges of citizenship. Okay, so the women were forgotten. Mm -hmm. uh, they did not rebel that I know of, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, much later, okay, in 1848, uh, you may uh, know about the Seneca Falls Convention. Uh, that's considered the first women's rights convention uh, in the United States. Um, it was organized by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott. And uh, they uh, gathered women uh, at Seneca Falls, New York, 1848. And um, there were 100 people there, uh, 70 women and 30 men. All right, so it wasn't just women at this women's rights convention, okay? Uh, some men showed up there as well. And they came up with a declaration of sentiments, okay, that all men and women are created equal, okay? They uh, took what Thomas Jefferson put in the Declaration of Independence, okay, but then added in, and women. All men and women are created equal, all right? Now, after that famous Seneca Falls Convention, it did take quite a while uh, for women uh, to get full uh, voting rights, suffrage uh, in our country. It wasn't until the 19th Amendment uh, was ratified in 1920 that women got uh, full voting rights in our country. So it took a long time. A lot of those women did not live uh, to see um, the 19th Amendment ratified. Uh, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia, 
Mott and others have passed away by then, but, uh, but it all uh, began with their efforts, though, at the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. So, okay, uh, number three. Uh, this future second lady broke new ground with her husband in 1892 when he was running as the Democratic vice presidential nominee. Uh, together, they took to the stump uh, in an era when this was not common, and both proved uh, to be popular speakers. All right, who do you think uh, this lady was? I know, I, I wasn't there, that. but I would guess because she was popular and she has a nickname of Jenny, I would choose her. I did, uh, I did too. No, I'm sorry. No. no. Well, well, then it was Morton. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> well, at least Letitia Stevenson. Yes, your third choice. It was Letitia Stevenson. Oh. Really? Yes, yes. Well, see, yeah, I who's... associated her with Adelaide. Oh, no. Yeah. But they weren't in 1892. No. Uh, well, the Adelaide the first, okay? Uh -huh. I think we're up to Adlai the fifth today. Yeah. Okay. But Adlai the first um, was uh, vice president from 1893 to 1897. Same family. Same family. Same family. Yes, from Illinois. Yes. Interesting. Yes. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. So, like I said, I think there's an Adlai Stevenson the fifth walking around uh -huh. out there today. All right. So it, it's a long uh, family, you know, dynasty there in politics. You know. Um, so. Um, yes, um, see, back in the 1800s, okay, um, it, it was not seen as gem gentlemanly to go out there and ask people to vote for you, okay, especially at the presidential level. Uh, it was seen as beneath the dignity of the office to go begging or asking for votes, okay. So the, the attitude back then was that man... Uh, should not seek the office, okay, but the office should seek the man, okay? So, uh, so people, uh, again, especially at the presidential level, did not campaign back then, mm. all right? Uh, so that's why with uh, question three there, the Stevensons broke new ground in 1892 in that regard, okay? Uh, so uh, they... Um, so they took to the stump. Uh, they proved to be quite popular uh, speakers, okay? And uh, another thing the Stevensons did, uh, once Adlai did become vice president um, in November of 1892, uh, he and his family all resided together in Washington, D.C., okay? See, it, it was not common back then in the 1800s for the vice president's family to join him in Washington, okay? Usually the wife and the children, uh, for various reasons, stayed back home, uh, which would have been like on the family farm, okay? And tended to uh, the business back at home, okay? But uh, Letitia and their children uh, joined Adlai uh, in D.C. Uh, during his four-year vice presidential term, okay? So that was unique for back then as well. Okay. And back then, a lot of the times, the vice presidents would live either in a hotel in D.C. or in a boarding house in D.C. Okay. Uh, as you know, there is a, a question coming up about the official vice presidential residence. Okay, so I'll elaborate more on that when we get to that question. Okay, so. okay. Uh, number four. Uh, this second lady got involved in charitable work in D.C., <clears throat> And one of her major charitable activities was in helping to provide free meals to impoverished children at a place called the Diet. <coughs> uh, now, Diet, uh, basically what that means is the food that you eat in order to uh, sustain yourself, okay? Uh, <coughs> if you're trying to lose weight, uh, that would be called a special diet, okay? But every human being is on a diet because that's the food you consume right. to stay alive, okay? So... So she uh, volunteered her time at a place called the Diet Kitchen Welfare Center, and she bonded with an ill child uh, there <clears throat> and tried to improve his health. Uh, together with her husband, the incumbent vice president, they unofficially adopted this child. Uh, who was she? <clears throat> I said Carol. 
Harry Sherman? Uh, no. No. I did too. Lois Marshall. Lois Marshall. Yes, Gloria. Right. Okay. You redeemed yourself now. <laughs> right. Compared to the last question. <laughs> um, yes. So. Um, uh, her husband was Thomas R. Marshall, who was Woodrow Wilson's vice president. All right. He was the governor of Indiana and then became vice president, uh, much like uh, the current vice president, Mike Pence, uh, governor of Indiana, and then became vice president. Um, so, um, so basically, um, at this uh, Diet Kitchen Welfare Center in D.C., where Lois Marshall volunteered her time, um, there was this child, his name was Clarence Morrison, okay? And uh, he was uh, one of uh, uh, a set of twins, okay? And uh, their mother came into the diet center uh, seeking uh, assistance for these newborn twins, okay? So uh, Lois bonded with one of the two there, Clarence uh, Morrison. And uh, she tried to find a treatment for him. I could not find in my research exactly what his affliction was or illness, but just that he was ill. Mm -hmm. So whatever he had, I don't know. But uh, Lois Marshall uh, took him, like you know, to doctor's appointments, uh, tried to get the best treatment uh, for him. <clears throat> and I presume, in consultation with her husband, they unofficially adopted this child uh, from the the, uh, the the poor mother. Okay, <clears throat> so they named him uh, Morrison Marshall, all right? He was Clarence Morrison, all right? So when they unofficially adopted him, they took his last name, made it his first name, Morrison, okay? And then gave him their surname, uh, Marshall, Lois and Thomas Marshall, the vice presidential couple. And Izzy, his nickname was Izzy, I-Z-Z-Y, okay? So uh, again, she took him to doctor's appointments. She tried to improve his health, but uh, unfortunately his condition worsened uh, and he died in February of 1920 and he wasn't quite four years old yet. You know? so, um, so that's, uh, that would have been again Lois Marshall there and her husband Thomas. Okay? So. Now I believe, I think, uh, it, it was her husband Thomas Marshall, by the way, um, one time, I think when he was listening, as you may know, the vice president presides over the Senate. That's his only constitutional job, to pre preside over the U.S. Senate, okay? So one day, I believe the story goes, he was uh, listening to the debate going on among the senators in the, in the Senate chamber, and I don't know, uh, something, I think one of the senators said, oh, you know, what this country needs is X, Y, or Z, okay? When they were discussing public policy, I presume. And then I believe he was the one who famously said, oh, you know, I guess he was getting like bored with the debate going on in the Senate there. And he said, you know, what this country really needs is a good 10 cent cigar. <laughs> 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 right. So I believe that's attributed to uh, Thomas Marshall there. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, number five. Um, this second lady served as her husband's private secretary and office manager during his 30-year tenure in Congress. Uh, when he became vice president, uh, she stayed by his side as his personal secretary. Uh, who was she? I said Gardner. Uh, what's that? Gardner. Uh, yes, Marriott Gardner. Very good. Yes, correct. Yes. That's the only name I could recognize from John Nance Gardner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yes, right. John Nance Gardner's wife. Right, right. Okay. So, um, Yes, so John Nance Garner was elected to Congress in uh, 1900, I believe it was, or 1902. Um, yeah, 1902, and uh, served for a long, long time in the House of Representatives. Uh, his last two years there, 1930 to 32, he served as Speaker of the House, okay? Then in 1932, uh, he agreed to be FDR's uh, running mate on the Democratic ticket, okay? Uh, probably reluctantly, okay? Because no doubt he wielded more power as Speaker of the House than as Vice President, okay? Back then, 
vice presidents uh, were not given really any tasks to do like they are today. All right? Basically, they just presided over the Senate, and that was it. And, and that fulfilled their only constitutional duty. So, uh, so uh, Mariette uh, was her husband's uh, private secretary and office manager when he was a congressman and then speaker. Okay? Then when he became vice president, uh, she did stay by his side as his private uh, secretary. Okay? Now, uh, that did uh, cause some tongues to start wagging, as you might imagine, back then. Uh, this would have been unheard of. You know, the vice president's wife is uh, also his employee. You know? uh, so that did not go over too well in some quarters back then. Uh, but uh, she did it, and she, she did it well. She was very deft at what she did. Uh, she ran his office very smoothly and happy to do it. And, uh, you know, they had a good marriage, as far as I, uh, I know. So, uh, but again, that, that would have been quite unusual for the time. Uh, even today it would be unusual, you know, uh, but even, you know, more so back then. So, okay, uh, number um, six. Uh, this second lady, upon being thrust into her new role as first lady, uh, avoided the media, did not grant media interviews, and maintained a low public profile. Also, her elderly and ailing mother became the first presidential mother-in-law to take up residence in the White House. Uh, who was the second and later first lady? That's true. Bess Truman, yes, very good. Bess Truman. Yes. Okay, now why did Bess Truman avoid the media? Okay, in the early 1900s, uh, her father committed suicide, all right? Uh, uh, financial problems combined with drinking, all right? And he committed suicide. And uh, obviously, this uh, affected uh, Bess and her family uh, very much. Okay, so um, so out of fear of public knowledge uh, of her father's suicide, okay, uh, that's why she avoided the media because she thought if she spoke with them, if she granted them interviews, if she allowed them to uh, have a discussion with her. Uh, her, her father's suicide would come up or be revealed, okay? And back in the 1940s, um, when, uh, when she was second lady, uh, and then to become first lady, uh, there was this stigma attached, okay? Not, not only to the memory of the suicide victim, but to their family uh, as well, okay? To the surviving family members as well. And she was very cognizant of this, and again, that's why went to great pains to avoid the media because she didn't want this to be brought up about her father's suicide. Okay, uh, but at the same time, she was avoiding the media and keeping a low public profile outside of the White House. Uh, inside of the White House, she did conduct an active social life. Okay, so for example, with uh, with social events, you know, state dinners, things like that. Uh, sponsoring different charities, uh, various causes. She was still active, okay, but within the confines of the White House, not outside the White House, okay? Because again, she was, she was just, she lived in fear, okay, that her father's suicide uh, would become public knowledge and up for discussion. And again, back then, there, there was this stigma attached to suicides, uh, not just to the victim him or herself, but to the victim's family as well. And she just uh, didn't want any part of it and wanted to avoid any discussion of that at, at any cost. You know? And uh, she did uh, have uh, an elderly and ailing mother, too, uh, when she became first lady, because as you know, probably, FDR died suddenly, uh, April 12th, uh, 1945, right, okay. So uh, his vice president now, Harry Truman, uh, becomes president, okay? Therefore now Bess goes from being second lady to first lady, okay? And there's a famous little conversation that uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, when her husband died, uh, like that same day or maybe the day after, uh, a little conversation Eleanor had with Harry Truman, the incoming new president. And uh, uh, 
Harry Truman said to Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, Mrs. Roosevelt, you know, I'm so sorry about your husband. Uh, is there anything I can do for you? And she said something to the effect, uh, well, don't worry about me, uh, Mr. Truman. I'll be fine. Uh, what, what can I do for you? Okay, uh, because, you know, Harry Truman was stepping into some big shoes there uh, that he had to fill, okay? And he, by some people, he was not seen as, uh, like, worthy to be FDR's successor, okay? That he was always in the shadow of FDR. And now suddenly he's going from being number two to number one, and was he up to it or not, you know? So he, um, but he was a fighter. He could be pretty scrappy, and as you may know, uh, in 1948, when he was seeking his own four-year term, he was being written off. Uh, a lot of people thought his Democratic uh, Republican, I'm sorry, Republican opponent, Governor Thomas C. Dewey of New York, uh, was going to beat him in 1948. Uh, but he, uh, he rallied. He conducted a famous whistle-stop uh, train uh, a tour of the country. And, uh, you know, give him Hell Harry was his nickname. All right. So he, and he pulled off an upset victory in, uh, in, uh, on Election Day, November of 48. So, but, okay. Uh, number seven. Uh, this second lady's husband's vice presidential term <coughs> saw the word Veep uh, coined. And she, in fact, wrote a memoir. I married the Veep. Uh, sadly, uh, they both died of heart attacks eight years apart. Uh, who was she? I said Barclay. Uh, yes, you would be correct. Yes, Elizabeth Jane Barclay. Yep. Alvin Barclay's wife. Let's give it a regular name. Yes, Al Alvin, uh, Alvin, Alvin Barclay's Alvin wife Barclay. from Kentucky. Right. When was that? Okay. They were also under Roosevelt. No, oh. under Truman. Yeah. Truman. Right. Under Truman. Uh, right. Oh, that explains why I don't know it. Okay. Uh, before my time. Yeah. <laughs> under Truman. Okay. Uh, vice President under Truman. Yes, correct. Uh, Alvin Barkley uh, was Truman's vice president uh, January of 49 to January of uh, 53. Yes. So, um, yeah. So, um, so uh, J uh, Elizabeth Barkley. Uh, she, she preferred to be called Jane because she was afraid people were going to like nickname her Liz or Lizzie and she didn't want that, you know. So she took, I believe, her middle name there and went by that to prevent people from calling her Liz or Lizzie, all right. So, um, so I believe it was their grandson, the Barclays' grandson, who uh, one day, I don't know, he just, you know, he was having a conversation with his grandparents, I think it was, and he uh, said the word Veep, and it took hold. So nowadays, so since then, it, it's a nickname for uh, the vice president. Okay. So. Uh, Julia Dreyfus, Veep. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, when, uh, when Truman retired in uh, January of 53, um, Barclay, as vice president, uh, did uh, briefly uh, wage a campaign to succeed his boss and become president. But he was uh, in his mid 70s at yeah. the time, okay? And uh, he wasn't, uh, because of his age, uh, the unions, which were still pretty strong at that time in our country, uh, were dismissing him. And if you were a Democrat back then and you didn't have union support, forget it, okay? So without that union support, uh, because they were dismissing him because of his age, uh, he gave it up, okay? So he, what happened was, so he ran for the Senate um, and went back into the Senate, the U.S. Senate, where he was serving before Truman picked him to become vice president, okay? Mm -hmm. And one day, uh, so 1956, he was lecturing at a college in uh, the D.C. area one day and uh, dropped dead at the podium while he was giving a public lecture. They had died of a heart attack. And uh, his wife, Jane, uh, she became uh, a secretary at a college, uh, a different one, I believe, than where he uh, spoke and dropped dead. 
Um, so uh, Jane became a secretary at a college in the D.C. area, and then eight years after her husband died of a heart attack, so in 1964, she dies of a heart attack as well. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. Obviously, they weren't blood-related, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but they both died of the same uh, problem. You know, um, so I just thought that was interesting. That's why I, I stuck that in there. Yeah, but okay. Um, now I, I really enjoyed when I when I came across this information for number eight. I I just I had to chuckle to myself. I thought it was kind of humorous, uh, but it's true though. Uh, not wanting to be thrust into the national spotlight, either for her or her family. This future second lady did not support her husband's vice presidential candidacy. Upon hearing of the offer to her husband to join the ticket, she reportedly, tearfully asked, can you get out of it? <laughs> so who do, you, who do you think this poor woman who dreaded being in the spotlight uh, was? Pat Nixon. Uh, no. No. I said Agnew. Yes, uh, Judy Agnew. Mm -hmm. Yes. Eleanor Julie. Lady Berg and Pat Nixon, they were not flowers Shrinking on the wall. Violence. They were not, yeah. yeah. They, yeah. Right, I right. can imagine them being not. True, right, flowers. that's right. Yes. They were nice ladies. I'm not saying Oh, yes, sure. I'm yes. going to say that. Pat would consult an astrologer. Yes. Yeah, so uh, Spiro one day, you know, comes home. And he's like, oh, honey, well, I'm not, you know, I'm paraphrasing him, but, oh, honey, you know, uh, Richard Nixon asked me uh, to run with him on the Republican ticket for vice president, you know, uh, what do you think? You know, and he was, I presumably, uh, uh, presumably expecting her to be happy for him mm -hmm. and to support him, you know, and that's, you know, <laughs> and she was right away, you know, the, the gears uh, were, were going into motion there, and, you know, because she, she valued her privacy, she didn't want to be in the spotlight, you know, and she knew now <clears throat> this would thrust her uh, into the spotlight, the campaign, and then if they won, you know, once being in office. So that's why she's like, oh God, you know, you've got to be kidding me. Can you get out of it, you know? <laughs> and obviously he must have told her no, because he accepted Richard Nixon's offer. And uh, in uh, November of 68, they won, barely, one of the closest elections uh, in U.S. history. Um, and uh, some, uh, uh, <clears throat> Some newspapers were uh, predicting a, a Humphrey victory that year, okay, uh, or favoring Humphrey. Um, but uh, in the end, uh, Nixon uh, pulled it off, you know. Uh, but again, it was a very close election. And we had George Wallace running that year on the American Independent ticket. Uh, so that sort of like helped narrow things up between Nixon, the Republican, and Humphrey, the Democrat, as well. All right, so, but uh, yeah, so uh, Nixon and Agnew won. Poor Judy now. Mm -hmm. She becomes second lady, much to her chagrin, you know. And, uh, but she, uh, she didn't, you know, she wasn't, and, and, and this is, of course, what she wanted, you know, uh, she wasn't out there, and that, that pleased her just fine. Uh, she, uh, you know, she was a, a homemaker. Uh, she uh, enjoyed doing. Uh, you know, what would have been considered housewife duties back then, okay? She packed her husband's bag every morning there before he went off to work, you know. And she just enjoyed, you know, being a homemaker and cooking and sewing and, and things like that, you know. And just dreaded uh, the, the public spotlight. Now, unfortunately, uh, as you may know, uh, she was thrust uh, into it nonetheless, or especially her husband, uh, because of... Uh, charges or accusations that were brought against him while he was vice president, right? Accepting kickbacks when he was governor of Maryland, tax evasion, okay? So he pleaded no contest, uh, resigned on October 10th, 1973. <coughs> so him and Judy faded off into the sunset, and then that's when Nixon needed a new vice president now and picked Gerald Ford. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, Nixon resigns the following year, and now Ford becomes president. Right? Some of you might remember that whole saga there yeah, in the yeah. early to mid-70s, right? So, but poor Judy, I, you know, I, again, I, I chuckled when I, when, I, when I was researching her, and I came across this quote, and I, I felt for her, you know. I'm like, oh, that poor woman, you know, she just, uh, she just did not, you know, want to be thrust into the spotlight. 
Yeah, but her husband apparently his political ambitions, uh, you know, superseded her concerns. So, okay, number nine. Uh, this second lady and her husband were the first vice presidential couple uh, to move into the newly established vice presidential residence on the grounds of the U.S. Naval Observatory in D.C. Anybody want to take a stab at that one? Happy Rockefeller? Uh, no. 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 Mondale. Mondale. Yeah, the Mondales. Yeah, Joan and Fritz. Yeah, yeah. Yes, they were the first vice presidential couple to take up residence in the in the newly uh, established uh, vice presidential residence. Now, was there a temporary residence that the, before okay. that? Okay. Okay. Here's the thing. Okay. Now, prior to the Mondales, okay, uh, all vice presidents. Uh, either lived in their own home, like in, in the D.C. area, okay, uh, or, as I mentioned earlier, lived in a hotel, like the famous Willard Hotel yeah, yeah. in D.C., or uh, some of them actually lived in boarding houses uh, in D.C., okay, and of course, and there was no Secret Service protection back then, okay. Um, so, uh, but uh, what was happening uh, by the 1970s is that it was getting very costly, uh, to provide Secret Service protection to the vice presidents and their wives and children uh, in their own home, okay? Uh, so uh, what, uh, what was decided, uh, and it was actually the Rockefellers, uh, Margareta and uh, Nelson, uh, who asked Congress for uh, an appropriation, okay, to establish an official vice presidential residence, okay? So uh, what Congress did is they took the U.S., uh, the residence at the U.S. Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C. It's off uh, Massachusetts Avenue, okay? And uh, that was built in 1893, okay, uh, for the superintendent uh, of the uh, grounds of the Naval Observatory, okay? So uh, it was refurbished. Again, the, the Rockefellers asked Congress if they would do this, okay? Now, it, it was ready after they refurbished it in the early 70s, uh, early to mid-70s. It was ready uh, for the Rockefellers while Nelson was serving as Ford's vice president, okay? But <clears throat> they chose to uh, remain in their own home in the D.C. area, okay? However, they did use the, the newly established vice presidential residence uh, to do some official entertaining, okay, because it had the space there, all right? But they did not uh, sleep there at night, okay? They slept in their own home in the D.C. area. So when uh, Ford uh, lost the election in 76, and then Carter and Mondale now become president and vice president, uh, Joan and Walter Mondale uh, decided uh, yes, all right, it's there. You know, Congress spent the money. Uh, let's use it, okay, you know, uh, for our actual residents, not just like the Rockefellers to host uh, dinners there or parties. So the Mondales were the first couple uh, to actually move into and live in the, vice pre the official vice presidential residence, okay? And every vice presidential couple and some of them with their children as well, since the Mondales, without exception, have lived in the vice presidential residence, okay? Uh, the only interruption would have been uh, in 2001 uh, with 9-11, uh, the Cheneys were moved to another location uh, for better uh, security, uh, okay? Uh, for better safety, okay? So, but other than that uh, little interruption there after 9-11 with the Cheneys, uh, every vice presidential couple since the Mondales have lived in the official residence. And nobody, did anybody ever live, nobody ever lived like in Blair House? That is Blair. Yes. That is Blair House, isn't uh, it? No, no, they're two separate. Well, they are Blair House. Oh, was that really all, yeah. was yeah. Blair House really only reserved for visiting dignitaries? Exactly, right. Blair House is uh, reserved for visiting uh, dignitaries rather than, you know, rather than uh, sending them to a hotel 
all right? Usually they're put up at Blair House, okay? Now, uh, one president has lived at Blair oh. House. Do we know? Any guesses who that might have been? Oh, would that have been Truman during the renovation? Yes, exactly, right. Uh, by the time Truman became president, okay, uh, the White House had undergone so many different renovations, okay, mm -hmm that the, the whole building was like in a weakened state, okay, because of all the hammering that took place, all the, uh, the things that were taken out, okay, and then put back together, the sawing, the hammering and all that. Uh, it, it was really in a weakened state by then, okay. So Truman, uh, rather than just like tinker around the edges, okay, decided to do a complete overhaul of the White House. So he voluntarily moved, uh, him and his family into Blair House, okay, which is right within sight of the White House there. Mm -hmm. And he was working and, and living out of Blair House from like 48 to 52. Basically his, his whole four year term, okay, uh, he was in Blair House. So uh, they completely redid the White House. They uh, put in like a steel frame, okay, because you know, it, it was built by uh, black slaves right, in the, in the uh, 1790s, okay. Uh, so by the, 19, the late 1940s, early 1950s, now of course we've had much more modern construction equipment and construction materials. So uh, a steel frame was put into the White House. They installed central air conditioning. It never had it prior to this, okay. Uh, you know, modern bathrooms for, for back then, okay. Uh, so it was completely redone. So when Ike moved in now, Dwight Eisenhower, January of 53, uh, he was moving into basically this brand new building, you know, residence, thanks to his predecessor, Harry S. Truman. So. Yeah, there was, of course, that story about Margaret Truman's, uh, his daughter's piano yes. falling through the ballroom yes. floors. Uh, yes, uh, right, uh, right. And, and one time a reporter uh, severely, I believe it was a reporter, severely criticized her piano playing. Oh, and Harry let that reporter have it. You know, give him hell Harry. Right? Okay. He swung into action again, you know. So, yeah, yeah. And the balcony. Uh, know, that's right, the yes, Truman balcony. Yes, the Truman balcony. balcony. He had that built. Uh, the one, I believe it's on the south, it faces the south lawn of the White House. Uh, the south side. Right. So it's known as the Truman Balcony uh, because he's <coughs> the one who had it built that time. And when, when Dewey, uh, the governor of New York, a Republican, was running against Truman in 48, okay, uh, I, I collect political campaign memorabilia, you know, buttons and bumper stickers and things like that. So I don't have one of these, but I, I've seen it like come up at auctions, okay. Uh, the uh, supporters of uh, Dewey that time uh, it probably was not sanctioned, officially sanctioned by the Dewey campaign, but it was probably just uh, an eager supporter. Had this particular uh, lapel button made, okay, and it said, uh, you know, uh, uh, suggesting that, you know, uh, Dewey would, would be the winner now in 48, okay. The, the button, the, the campaign button says, Truman was screwy to build a porch for Dewey. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right, you know, kind of cute, yeah. and it, it, it sends a message, you know, that why why did Truman bother building that balcony? Because Dewey's going to win the election yeah. anyway, so Truman's not going to really get to enjoy it, you know what I mean? So why bother, you know? But uh, as as we know, Truman pulled off an upset victory, so he indeed. I did get to enjoy lounging out on the on the balcony there after all that he had built. So, <coughs> yeah. all right. And uh, the last uh, question. Other than uh, Mariette Garner in the 1930s, uh, this second lady was the only other vice presidential spouse uh, known to have held a paying job while her husband was vice president. Jill Biden. Yes. Yes. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe that was the that and number one maybe were the or number two were the easiest ones on the quiz. <laughs> was that American Red Cross? Uh, no. Okay. I'm trying to. No. Uh, one of the second ladies uh, did volunteer for the uh, American Red Cross, and I believe it was Elo Wallace. Okay, Henry Wallace's wife. 
he was uh, FDR's second vice president. He had three altogether, Garner, Wallace, and then Truman, okay? But Elo Wallace, who was uh, Henry Wallace's uh, wife, uh, I believe uh, she actually uh, helped out the, uh, the American Red Cross during World War II, so. I think Jill Bike was a lawyer, wasn't she? Uh, no, a uh, professor, actually, oh, yes, yes. yes. She was in my profession. Okay. Yes. So Jill Biden, the whole eight years that Joe was vice president, uh, she, uh, and like me, she uh, taught or teaches, I think still does, at a community college. <laughs> uh, she's, uh, her field is uh, English and um, reading, developmental uh, writing, okay. So the whole eight years, uh, she taught at uh, two different community colleges in Delaware, okay. So other than Marriott Garner, uh, Jill Biden is the only other second lady who we know of uh, who held a paying job while her husband was vice president. So, all right. Uh, so I guess at this point, if anybody uh, has any questions about second ladies or vice presidents. I have flunked him. I had a quick story. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, I, we got a whole room full of Patriots fans here. Barbara and I were in, in Florida two it's the Patriots game playing the Atlanta Falcons. Yeah. They're, they're down 24 to what, nothing in the third, in the fourth. And I, okay. I decided, instead of going to bed, I stay up and I watch it. Okay. There's a store, there's a CVS down the road that sells globe, Boston Globes, hmm. about a mile from mm -hmm. where we are. I got the picture of the picture. And we, and Barbara, so, I go down and I buy the Globe in the morning, and there's the front page. Tom Brady flattened his back with a big headline, Patriots lose, and so forth and so on. Uh, later, and of course, when I saved that for my son who's in the newspaper business, because it's one of the you know great uh, early editions that was wrong. Oh, okay. So, yes. And I came back to Barbara and I said, you know, that sounds like Dewey Truman. Yes, uh, yes, and that's right. The later Chicago that day, Trump. we went over to the Red Sox spring training to watch some, well, just, actually they weren't there at that point. There was, but we just wanted to peek in the, in the doors at JetBlue Park where the Red Sox trained. Mm -hmm. And we met a woman from the Boston area who was our age who thought the Patriots had lost. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I said to her, I said, you didn't hear? They won. I said, and I had this paper in my hand, and she said, that's just like Dewey Truman. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's right. <laughs> the paper that came out. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yep. Chicago Daily Tribune. Because yes. the newspapers were out yes. in the U.S. Yes, yes. That Dewey had won. Yes, that's right. Well, a quick little story in return for you. Um, I, as I mentioned, I, I do collect political campaign memorabilia. Yeah. So <clears throat> in my uh, collection at home, I do have some uh, newspapers that have erroneous headlines yeah. when it comes to elections, okay? So I, I actually do have the, the Dewey defeats the Dewey. Truman, okay? <laughs> Probably hanging up on a wall yeah. in my collection. Yeah, well, yeah. You know? I've seen pictures of it. Yeah. You have yeah. one. Huh? So I have. I'm lucky yeah. enough to, yeah. I, somehow I was able to afford it that time. They're not cheap, as you might yeah. imagine, you know? Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, every, yeah. You know, every collector would love to have yeah. one of those, you know? Yeah, but, uh, yeah see, what happened was the, uh, the press men were on strike that night, on election night. Yeah. Oh, back in 48? And back in 48, okay. So uh, they were rushing to get out the morning edition, okay. And they were relying on uh, help uh, to fill in for the actual pressmen at, at the newspaper offices there in Chicago. So they, they basically slapped, slapped the paper together, okay. And uh, some of the columns, uh, because they were in a hurry, the, the, like one of the columns in the copy that I have, the edition, it's actually upside down, okay? They were careless, so you have to like to read that, those paragraphs, excuse me, you have to like flip the paper, okay? And you know, and then, and then when you're done, then put it back, and then, you know, upright to read it the way it actually should be read, okay? So, um, so be because um, everybody thought Dewey was going to win that night, okay? And uh, see what happened is like Gallup and the others stopped polling at least a week before the election because they're like, why bother? It, it's in the bag for Dewey, you know? So uh, the polling wasn't done that last week leading up to the election. But Truman, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, was on that uh, whistle stop campaign tour and really hustling there and uh, trying to uh, uh, um, stage a comeback, okay, or a, or a stage of victory. Uh, so he, uh, so a lot of people that last week during the uh, before the election swung around to Truman, okay, but because they weren't polling people. Uh, that wasn't, uh, 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 it didn't come to light, okay? So, um, so because the pressmen were on strike, trying to get the paper out the next morning, they slapped it together, and they just went ahead with what they thought was going to be the news there the next morning, okay? So, but the next morning, obviously, right, okay, uh, it was found out that Truman did pull off a, a victory. So what the Chicago Daily Tribune did, okay, in the wee hours of the morning, when they saw that it looked like Dewey was going to pull it off after all, uh, they had sent out the bundles of papers, okay, to the newspaper carriers, you know, drop them off like in front of their house or on the street corner. So what happened was when they saw the error, when they knew there was an error, they sent their delivery trucks back out to try to retrieve the bundles of newspapers that they had dropped off for the news carriers, okay? And they um, took them to a landfill, you know, like, and incinerated, burned them, incinerated them, okay? Now, thankfully, some of them had already been picked up before the delivery trucks went out to retrieve them and were saved, okay? So every now and then, one of them will pop up, like, at an auction or in a fixed price catalog, you know, that us collectors get. And uh, so uh, when one of them came up for, for sale, uh, I happened to have, you know, enough uh, discretionary income at the time or savings, discretionary, you know, like savings. And, you know, I talked to my wife about it. She said, yeah, go ahead, you should get it, you know. So I got it. I, I got a frame for it, you know, and now it's hanging up uh, with some other newspapers in my, what I call my museum room at home with some other uh, papers with erroneous headlines, you know. So, so that's the story with the Chicago Daily Tribune there, you know, but, <laughs> so, uh, another one that people aren't as familiar with in 1916, I'll, I'll briefly tell you this, uh, people thought that um, Charles Evans Hughes, the Republican, was going to defeat Woodrow Wilson for re-election, okay, so some newspapers predicted a Hughes victory, okay, over the incumbent Woodrow Wilson. So one of those newspapers I have, it's the Cleveland Plain Dealer, okay, mm -hmm. and it has the erroneous headline, Hughes elected president or something mm -hmm. to that effect, you know. But see, what happened was the next morning when the returns from the West Coast came in, like California especially, they put Wilson over the top, okay. So, you know, so I think like Hughes went to bed that night thinking he was the next president, but when he woke up the next morning, he got a rude awakening, you know. And then I'll tell you a quickly a more recent example. In 2004, some of you might remember this, uh, some newspapers thought that John Kerry had picked Dick Gephardt to be his running mate, okay, when in fact, of course, he picked John Edwards, right, okay. okay? It was the two Johns, the, the two trial lawyers, right? So, uh, so the New York Post, uh, put out a paper uh, with a headline, uh, Kerry picks Gephardt for vice president, okay? So uh, when, I, when I found out about that, my, my wife, uh, well she passed, my, wife's, my wife had a friend who passed away now, living in uh, New York City. So her name was Rosette. So my wife Lori calls her up, she's like, Rosette, please, uh, you know, she explained the situation to her, I think Rosette knew about it already. She's like, please, for Richard, Go just run to the nearest store. See if you can get a copy of the New York Post there for Richard. <laughs> he wants it badly yeah. in his collection, you know. Yeah. So sure enough, my wife's late friend, yeah. she got one for me. She mailed it to okay. us. I got a frame for it, and I was yeah. hanging up there with yeah. the Chicago Daily Tribune with the Cleveland Plain Dealer, you know. So it's like, but I, you know, my wife and I had a swing into action. <laughs> 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 yeah. So. But anyway, so those are my little stories. So uh, does anybody else have anything? Uh, you left out Dolly Madison. 
Okay. Well, see, she was she was never second lady. She was only first. Oh, lady. she was only first. Lady. Only first lady. Okay. Right, right, right. But of course, we know the story about her taking the portrait right. of. Uh, although, see, she didn't literally take it down herself. She had some servants take yeah. it down, right? Of George, the portrait That's of George right. she was Washington. Never second lady. Uh, right, right. Yeah, she was only first lady, right? Yeah. So. Good piece of work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And by the way, she's the one who it's attributed um, the serving of ice cream, oh, that's right. right, in the White yeah. House. Right? Supposedly, it started with Dolly Madison. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So, all right. Uh, was fun. Any other questions, yeah. comments? Yeah. No. Gloria, you got anything? Uh, I just wanted to know: Did you bring books tonight? Uh, yes, I, I actually have uh, three copies left. I did bring them with me. I don't know if anybody's interested in purchasing one, if that's what you're getting to. Um, I do have three copies left here. Um, if, if I may, if anybody's interested, uh, they were $25, but I only have a few left. They're, let's say, $20 if any of you are interested. Okay. Um, okay, well, I would like one. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. All right. And um, just if any of you, you know, think about it, you change your mind yeah. after. Gloria has my contact information. Yeah. Okay. Just uh, she can give you my phone number or email address if you think later you might want one. You know. Just, uh, okay. Interesting. How about for your next book? Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you.